Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are again for another Soul Seeker podcast. This one, we're going to go deep about neuroscience and the brain and how it relates to psychedelics and living a whole and complete life in general. But before we do, as always, just let's just take a moment to ground in with some breath. So if you're listening to this and you're driving or you're doing anything at all that is keeping you away from being fully present, I would just encourage you to hit pause and come back to us when you can just anchor in with some breath. So with that said, let's all go ahead and find a comfortable seat, closing down the eyes and sitting straight up, laying the spine be tall, chest open, feeling your feet on the floor, your palms on your lap, And just bring your awareness to that space in between your eyebrows, that third eye space. Noticing if there's tension and just gently letting that tension go. And just looking with your eyes closed, just imagining that you're looking up towards that third eye area with your eyes. Just bringing your awareness there. And through the nose, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Hold the breath, rolling back the eyes, continuing to hold the breath. And through the mouth, audible exhale, let it go. Shoulders drop, belly to spine, let it go, let it go, let it go. Through the nose, letting the belly expand as you inhale all the way up. And when you get to the top, sipping in a bit more air and sip in a bit more. Hold the breath, roll back the eyes. Maybe apply a root lock. And just allowing yourself to feel. And through the mouth, audible exhale, let it go, let it go, let it out. And the last one, as you inhale through the nose, letting the belly expand and bring that prana, that life force energy all the way up to the chest, sipping in a bit more at the top, sipping in a bit more, rolling back the eyes as if you were to look up towards that third eye space. And just continuing to hold the breath and allowing yourself to be in this moment. Audible exhale, let it go, let it go, let it out, let it out. Letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and just flickering your eyes open when you're ready. So here we are. Podcast number 200 and something, something. I don't know. I'll have to look it up afterwards, see what number this is. Been many podcasts, but we haven't talked about eh, maybe a couple times uh, about the brain and its role with psychedelics. So with that, I am so honored and excited to speak with my guest, Jonathan Negus, and he is a nurse practitioner specializing in neurosurgery with nearly 30 years of experience. So with that, Jonathan, welcome to the pod. 
Thank you, Sam. And uh, nice to be here and nice to be with your listeners today. And uh, yeah, happy hellos to you all. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. So let's dive straight into it. Like you are very well versed with the brain. What are yeah. some common things that you think people should know about the brain? Just like some foundational stuff. Well, the brain, of course, is uh, an anatomic structure. It's an organ like your heart or your stomach or uh, any other organ in your body. And as such, it has a particular role to play, uh, whereas the stomach, of course, is part of digestion and the heart for pumping blood. Uh, the brain is a kind of a control center that uses electrochemistry and connective nerves throughout the body in order to uh, both communicate from the body to the brain in terms of sensations and in terms of the brain to the body in regards to different functions that the brain wants to do in order to keep the body in what's called homeostasis, which is a type of balance. And people think about the body as being kind of balanced at all times. They don't have any sensation of things kind of changing in a real second to second fashion, but it really is an incredibly complex uh, series of functions in terms of, as I've said before, both chemistry and electronic transfer of information down the nerves that keeps your blood pressure in a particular state and keeps your heart rate even and keeps your uh, endocrine glands, your thyroid and uh, things like this functioning and providing the right hormones to the body. And uh, in that way, we're able to stay balanced almost like a ship that's sailing at sea and needs to have its sails trimmed and changed and moved. And so you've got a lot of different uh, parts of the brain that handle different parts of the ship of the body, basically. You have different lobes. You have the frontal lobes that sit in front, and this is kind of executive function. It's the last part of the brain that kind of developed, if you look evolutionarily, where the brain is kind of wound from its small lizard brain, we call it kind of at the very center, uh, which is very reactionary and very kind of programmed. And then you get these higher and higher levels, which are wound around it, till you get to the you know, the male ma mammalian brain and the higher brain, the frontal lobes, which are responsible for critical thinking, for movement of the body, for higher judgment type of issues, uh, and also for um, some aspects of speech. And then you have the temporal lobes in the side, which are responsible for uh, portions of hearing and memory. There's some vision uh, that moves through that area as well. You have the parietal lobes on top, which are responsible for receiving sensations from the body and then telling the frontal lobes that this and that needs to happen in order for the body to continue to move in the way which is intended at that moment. You have the occipital lobe and back, which interestingly enough is very vital for seeing. Uh, if you think of the eyes as being like uh, cameras, then the back of the lobe is like the screen on which your experience of vision is projected. And so you can actually be blind from having an injury to the back of the head, it's called cortical blindness, with fully functioning eyes. Then we have the cerebellum, which is that little cauliflower type piece you may have seen kind of pushed onto the bottom of the brain which is responsible for fine motor, for balance. There's actually some speech function that goes along in there as well. And then the brain has uh, different um, nerves within it as well, called cranial nerves that come off of the stalk of the brainstem, which is how the spinal cord transitions into the brain and then branches out into different nerves that move the eyes, move the face, move the tongue, regulate different parts of the body as well. And all of these things are in different concert with each other in order to, as I say, have a conversation like this, basically. And as such, then um, we experience the world because of the way that the brain uh, perceives through the senses, through the eyes, through the ears, uh, through the tongue, through the nose, and then it paints this world uh, for us, which is then interpreted by the brain and that we're able to perceive and move through, uh, you know, pragmatically as a way of uh, taking advantage of this world and being human and being alive and uh, procreating and eating and doing all the very basic things that we're doing, as well as the more esoteric things, having discussions like this. And 
thinking about ourselves and who we are and what's going on in the world today, making sense of the world, perceiving reality, as it were, uh, in a very human way, a very unique way. And that's what the brain does. Awesome. Thank you. That is, is such a great foundation. Uh, it really, so many different things that we could pull out from there, but let's just get to the big question. How does psychedelics work with the brain in conjunction with the brain? Like to your knowledge, could you speak to psychedelics in the brain? Well, when we talk about psychedelics, um, and this, of course, the word psychedelic is, is a nomenclature. It's a, a word which is chosen really to describe um, a number of different substances that may work slightly different from each other. I think classically, when we talk about psychedelics, we're talking about psilocybin uh, mushrooms. Um, we're talking about LSD. And uh, these types of substances are, um, they deal with serotonin, which is one of the main neurotransmitters that we have in the body for making sense of the world and for regulating our emotions and our sense of relationship and connectedness with ourselves in the world. And so these classic psychedelics, as we call them, are 5H2A serotonin receptor agonists, which means that we have these open mouths on our nerve endings that are ready to accept certain neurotransmitters such as serotonin, which is secreted and then fits in. And then we have a particular experience from that. And so when we regulate the serotonin in different ways, then we can have different experiences. And the feeling is with classical psychedelics such as these, that it works with the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes and some of the um, regulatory agency of the brain, which kind of keeps things very steady for us, where we're able to recognize a chair as a chair and a person as a person. And there's certain separations between things which are necessary for us to go about our day to day business you know, melting into a chair and having yourself be the same thing as a tree, uh, which we can describe, you know, as part of the unifying experience that these um, substances may provide for us uh, in the absence of any kind of, you know, integration can certainly be a difficult way uh, to proceed as a human being. And so, uh, what they do then in those situations is they break down a lot of the rigid structures that cause separation. Uh, they create more of a unity consciousness situation where people come to understand that they're part of something larger that often feels divine to them, something ancient and divine. Um, it, it allows them to reevaluate certain parts of their history and their story and um, how they have come to view themselves in the world, what they're dragging along from their accumulated life, and the feelings that go along with those things, which may be, you know, very positive, pride, um, you know, um, may also be things like shame or guilt that have been associated with certain things, and being able to re-evaluate those things in a setting of um, boundaryless, um, knowing uh, just a pure kind of awareness uh, allows us then to reapproximate uh, our relationship with ourselves and with others in a way which can uh, be uh, revolutionary and mind expanding and we become so locked into certain paradigms and orthodoxies in regards to who we are and what's going on just the opportunity to take a break from that story and to look at it from a different angle then through this mechanism uh, can be very therapeutic. So then when we're, we're, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, and then we have atypical types of psychedelics, such as MDMA and ketamine, uh, which work in different ways. And MDMA, rather than being called a true psychedelic, might be called a, an empathogen, where you feel like a certain empathy might be the predominant uh, experience that you're having there, both towards yourself and to others. And then ketamine, of course, is a dissociative, which has come into a great practice in terms of working with uh, psychedelic assisted therapies for depression and anxiety, you know, almost in a way which is through opposition, 
joining with the psychedelic experience, if we can think of classical psychedelia as uh, the erasing of all boundaries, and then we can think of ketamine as like a dissociative and a pulling yourself out from all things, which can be identified. So there's a similar type of opportunity there for evaluating yourself in a fresh uh, and unique way, uh, often with um, you know talk therapy and analysis and things that go along with it for integration standpoint, uh, but is not a classical psychedelic. So when you say that with uh, psychedelics, it, it's unlocking the brain, and I'm not using scientific words, I'm just like making this accessible to anyone listening, but kind of mm -hmm. helping the brain to access the the most amount of capacity that we can access because a lot of times in these different plant and earth medicine ceremony experiences or even a re recreational use with psychedelics we just naturally start to see and think uh, things from a different perspective and we're able to let go of old stories and narratives and beliefs that aren't serving us so what's happening happening there from a scientific point of view well, there's something that's called a um, default mode network, mm -hmm. which if you think about it is the brain's uh, programming. And, you know, we come into this world from a genetic standpoint, you know, we talk about in classic, um, you know, developmental therapy, nature versus nurture in terms of what are the developmental and um, conditioned ways in which each person becomes each distinct person? And so part of this is certainly your experiences. And then part of it is the genetic predisposition that you have in the way that has been passed along from your father and mother and your ancestors and your relatives as a kind of foundational structure for how we then interpret the experiences that come to us. And in so doing, by the time we're you know, more than five years old, we have a fairly intact persona or personality or certain tendencies, a way of seeing ourselves in the world. And then everything that plays out afterward is sorted by the brain and placed in certain categories of good or bad, um, you know, uh, important to me, not important to me. And so we're building this structure of self as we uh, as we age and as we mature. And as I've said before, this can certainly be good if you're building yourself in a foundational way, which is um, loving and compassionate and open and allowing. And it can be difficult if we've had experiences or if there are aspects of ourselves which tend to see the world in ways which are more separating and more um, judgmental and um, which create feelings of, can create bad feelings that makes us suffer. And when we then um, become mature adults, a lot of these ways are difficult for us to access or understand or even know exist. Uh, and this gets into, you know, Jung's kind of shadow self, right? where there's parts of our personality and programming and behavior, there's wounds, there's childhood traumas, uh, there's a lot of things which are hidden from us that we don't even know are pulling little levers and making us move and maneuver in a way which is forcing us to um, see ourselves in the world in a very restrictive way. And this can then be part of the brain's hardwiring. If we think about, you know, being a computer, we become hardwired at that point to see the world a particular way. And that's this default mode network, which now says, you know, I don't have time to think about something cognitively with my frontal lobes when it comes in. I've already made a judgment based upon that and I'm gonna react a particular way and uh, I think all of us have had situations where uh, we're involved in maybe an argument or something like that, and we find ourselves saying things or behaving in a way. And I know when it happens to me, I'm almost stepping outside of myself and going, what am I even talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just this weird kind of reaction that's welling up, you know, from, from below. So uh, real quick, so what we're talking about here is triggers. When we're experiencing a trigger, the what's going on with the brain is it's the default mode network. When where exactly is the default mode network? Uh, it's down uh, in the uh, 
like the central portions of the brain that we were talking before about the way that the brain is formed kind of from the more primitive all the way through. So this is a more primitive type of structure. Those primitive structures are more central and lower down. Okay. So it's a center and low. So when we experience a trigger, you know, cause I'm just thinking about myself, like next time, like I experience this trigger, can I feel in my body and locate it where it's at? Cause the default mode network that is now associated this based off of prior experiences and there's no time for you know uh, like you said the frontal lobe to come in with analytical type mind this is where i have my six step breath process and i'm not sure yeah. if i've shared this with you before but this is the chance to respond when we experience that trigger versus get into that so yeah that's really fascinating that's how the deep Default mode network plays into experiencing a trigger. Please go on because I just want to highlight that because I think that's really important for us to understand. Right. And so I think what psychedelics allow us to do then is to uncover some of these triggers that you're talking about, which we may have not wanted to look at. Mm -hmm. And this might be even what somebody would call a bad trip, right? Where you're having um, archetypes of demons come up or where you're experiencing deep feelings of shame or regret or things like that. You're remembering things that you have done, perhaps. And, um, you know, it's interesting because we talk in the spiritual community a lot about healing the inner child of things that have happened to us. But I think it's equally interesting to think that we have to heal from the things that we have done. Have you ever thought about something like that before? And it, it, fall, it falls within the classical kind of Christian doctrine, perhaps, of Judgment Day, right? And something that happens to us um, after we pass away when, uh, you know, we end up being judged for the things that we did and the pain that that causes. And so those things can come come up for us with psychedelics as well. And we have, have the opportunity then to understand perhaps where that came from, why we're making certain decisions how we can keep from doing those types of things again, because now we've identified them. And, you know, I, I heard Joe Rogan say once the psychedelics provide a type of ceasefire. And I thought that that was such an interesting way to talk about this, where there is this bombardment going on of sensory experiences and of our responses, both emotionally and intellectually to those things, right? Uh, to the degree of which we're almost not aware of them. We have the subconscious things which are manipulating us like particular puppets. We're not thinking about going in and you know, brushing our teeth, you know, not, not deeply. You know, I notice every morning I get up and I do the same things. I would love to see a video from above of me, you know, being traced out and seeing what's happening because I think that it would be like identical. You know, I clean my ears, I turn around, I throw it into the trash can, like 99.9% .9 of the time it goes in. It's pretty far, but it's just these kind of rehearsed behaviors really that happen. And so if we can then through these substances um, identify what's a rehearsed reactive conditioned behavior versus how we can then look at things more thoughtfully and, you know, this then it comes into play with doing other spiritual work and wanting to change ourselves and wanting to figure out what is a higher way of approaching a particular situation uh, that'll be, you know, more reflective of, you know, that divinity, if I can stray into that territory, that's, you know, that's part of who we are. And, um, yeah, and so this is part of the, uh, the magic of the medicine it psychedelics put us into a non-normal situation, uh, oftentimes at high enough doses to where there isn't even recognizable forms or there isn't even recognizable language that happens. What's what's left of us at that point? Who are we then? And uh, the types of answers that come up in those types of uh, situations, non-local, non-traditional types of experiences where nonetheless there is an aware awake presence there that we're still calling me uh, gives us an opportunity for wholesale reevaluation of who we are and of what's going on and that can of course be very disruptive to the normal life this is where the integration work comes in 
and where we have to then come back from that experience. Uh, I think it was Ram Das, you know, who with Timothy Leary back in the 60s was uh, the Harvard professors that were beginning to use LSD in this fashion, realized its transcendental properties, but then they would always come back and they said, well, now who's going to do the dishes? Because they recognized that, you know, that still had to be done. And that, of course, is the old Buddhist trope of, you know, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And so the, the integration process after these um, types of profound experiences is, you know, as important as the experience is for bringing that and being able to embody and stabilize the knowledge that we've gained, that transcendent knowledge, into uh, our workaday world and, um, and and how we can benefit from that. So when I when I first did ayahuasca the first time, it, and I've talked to with a lot of people, and I don't know, I think I'm maybe maybe a couple times people had this experience, but it's super, super rare. And for me, it felt like a massage for this is an ayahuasca ceremony, it felt like a massage from the inside out. And when it got into my head, like my brain, and this is um, <laughs> when you hear this, or anyone listening hears this, you might be thinking like, huh, that doesn't sound good at all. But it felt amazing but it felt like my brain was getting kneaded like dough like imagine like you have dough on a what would it be a cutting board there's flour there and you're kneading the dough you're rolling it over and folding it and then you're pressing your knuckles into it and then after that you gotta clean your hands right so you wash your hands and then you uh take a dish towel and if that dish towel gets wet and we want to like get all the water out right what do we do with this uh dish towel we kind of like squeeze it out it. this is what it felt like in ayahuasca it felt like my brain was getting kneaded like dough and then afterwards it felt like a dish towel was getting squeezed out and i did ayahuasca i think six other times after that and it's been several years now since the last time i sat with aya but i believe every single time i've sat with the medicine that's usually how it starts and how it mm -hmm. feels for me yeah. is there anything that's coming up for you that might uh be like, oh, well, this could be what's happening in terms of the brain in that experience. I think so, because when you, if you want to get really esoteric about it to begin Please. with, try to describe our human experience, there's just something happening. Like mm -hmm. something is apparently occurring and something is apparently aware of it. You know, they talk about all you can really know for sure is I am, everything else is a belief. The one thing that you don't need to be described to you in language, that uh, you don't need um, agent, uh, an outside agent, a scientist or a priest or a politician to tell you is that you are and that you ex exist, right? This is, this is Descartes, this is I think, therefore I am. Absolutely everything else is an interpreted belief uh, using symbology and language in order to identify based upon differences um, what seems to be happening to you, uh, the you self that's seeing this and, and what it means. Like, like humans are meaning makers. Your job as this life is you're trying to figure out meanings for what's going on. And so what I think about when I hear an experience like yours, and when I think about a dish towel, I think about something that's sopping up and cleaning, right? Mm -hmm. And in so doing, then there comes a point of saturation of that dish towel, and it can no longer hold anything meaningfully. It's not an effective tool. And so what you're doing then in squeezing the brain out is you're breaking down all of these little prisons where the miracle of the being experience is been kind of clothed in meaning up until that point. And what you're allowing for in that moment is become to, for the brain to become a new, receptive, open, absorptive uh, sponge, like a child mind, right? Yeah, come to me as a little child in order then to see the world and yourself in that afresh. And so what we're talking about anatomically then is just, you know, this default note uh, network, which is opening up again uh, and to allow for new meaning to be made, which is not colored by everything which has come before it. 
I love that interpretation. Yeah, that totally resonates. And that that's certainly what it felt like in the experiences, but especially that first one. It was uh, in my own integration with medicines that I started to get more fascinated by the brain and, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work and others as well. And that's what when I started to be like, huh, maybe what was happening was like the nerve. And sometimes I'll get this a little bit off as I feel a little self-conscious talking with you because no. you would know this, right. But like the neuro pathways, like they would, they would die off and then the new uh, neurons would fire and wire together to create new neural networks. And I was sitting there like learning about this type of stuff and being like, huh, maybe that's what was happening from a scientific point of view in that experience, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Yeah, I think so. What we have learned, and this is getting a little bit into the second uh, benefit of psychedelics. We've talked about how they change our impression of things, right? But we're also finding out that they have neuroplasticity uh, enhancing abilities. And so we're talking about now about growing brain tissue, which, you know, in all of my conversations with patients with brain trauma and things like that in the past, I've had to say things like, well, you know, the brain doesn't regrow and there's kind of nothing that we can do about yeah. that. Uh, and we're finding out now uh, with psilocybin and, uh, and, and dimethyltryptamine studies and things like that with stroke patients that, no, you can actually rebuild new pathways and uh, even um, you know encourage new tissue growth in certain ways and the way that they do that is through um, creating a child mind ability to learn again and to create a situation where you're not limited by the experiences that you've had and in a way in this open state, in this new child mind way in which children are able to learn languages so quickly and they're able to learn music so quickly, uh, there is a profundity and a miraculousness and an awe-inspiring component of even the most mundane situation in our lives. We have become so blind to the miracle of being through the calluses of repetition and sameness in our in our day-to-day -day life and so what we're learning about let's say older people who are having neurodegenerative conditions and they're having memory issues and things like that that it isn't so important to do things like sudoku or crossword puzzles for keeping your brain sharp whatever you're doing has got to be attached to something that feels important that feels maybe even critical um the way that you remember that time that you almost got robbed you know that thing that's like locked into something that's this is important for my life and that is the way that children see almost everything and if we can recreate that situation where everything that we're happening uh to us is associated with a sense of awe and a sense of wonder and uh, a sense of gratitude then it remaps and reframes and regrows our ability to see ourselves and the world around us in ways which are revolutionary and transcendent and, uh, and beneficial to us as creatures who want to be happy and who want to spread happiness in the world. Uh, so th that's what comes up with, with that for me. Yeah, that's that's absolutely incredible. And I appreciate you saying that. So just just to really like drill down into this and unpack it a bit more, you've been in this field of work in the medical system for 30 years and the, okay. what people say in the medical field in this situation is if you have brain trauma, tough luck, essentially, right? The, yeah, more or less. Right. And now we're finding out, or at least you're finding out in your own research, probably outside of the organizations you're a part of, I would imagine right. that what's that? That's right. Yeah, outside. So you're finding out that the brain can, should we say, regrow? Is that what you we how we would define neuroplasticity? Yes, I would. Yes, I would say regrow. So if you were to go like within your 
culture of where you work and say this, how do you think that would be received by your peers? Do you think a lot of them would reject it because of their prior experience of what they were taught? I have had this discussion uh, with many of my colleagues, and although they're certainly not as current in this information uh, as the literature and the research which is being done now may uh, request, uh, they have heard enough to where they're interested. And I just want to bring one thing to note here that uh, one of my colleagues uh, from UCLA, uh, back when I worked there for 15 years, uh, Daniel Kelly, uh, world-renowned neurosurgeon, um, you know, has uh, instruments and procedures named after him, uh, particularly with the pituitary gland, um, and is working at the uh, now the Pacific uh, Neurosurgical Institute, which has different uh, West Side uh, hospitals that they work out of, has published the very first paper in the journal Neurosurgery called uh, Psychedelic Assisted Therapy and Psychedelic mm -hmm. Science, a Review and Perspective of Opportunities in Neurosurgery and Neuro-Oncology. And this is a, a landmark paper, uh, Dr. Dan Kelly, both in terms of, you know, putting his name behind psychedelic assisted therapy in this world renowned journal and spelling everything out so completely in terms of the history of working with these substances, uh, what the science is showing us now and all of the current studies which are being done and where we can possibly go with this uh, in terms of our future treatment programs. Um, personally for myself, uh, I'm an assistant uh, clinical professor still at UCLA, a, a volunteered position, so a titled position without pay. Uh, I, I take students from UCLA and I lecture there uh, once a year on brain trauma, actually, and it's something I've been doing for uh, a number of years, of course, uh, adapting and uh, changing the lecture as the science changes. And in talking about diffuse brain injury, which is a phenomenon whereby the brain gets shaken up inside of the rigid skull structure, such that these little pathways of the neurons connecting to the dendrites become twisted, break, refract, and pull apart from one another. It's a neurochemical process that has hundreds of different uh, hyperinflammatory stages that cause the degradation, the swelling, the loss of oxygenation, and the loss of functioning, and the, and the death of cells of the brain. Um, this is something which can't be operated on. It's not associated with a blood clot that can be taken out. It's not um, something which you can fix those parts of the brain. And we've been studying for decades and decades ways to interrupt all of this neurochemical pathway. And in my lecture, year after year after year, I've always had to say, there's nothing that can be done about this. Interestingly, they had been looking at some, uh, some molecules that were cannabinoid-based that had shown a little bit of promise. And I would mention that in my lecture, but even I didn't have the foresight to cast you know, into the future and say, well, wait a minute, you know, this is cannabinoids. What about if we start using something else? Uh, something like LSD, something like psilocybin, what would that do? And, you know, now for the past, I think, two years that I've been lecturing there, I've had the very pleasant opportunity of putting a new slide in, which says, until now. Hmm. And then we talk about these substances, uh, DMT, psilocybin, um, LSD, and their role in the future of brain healing. And what a glorious and wonderful that thing that is, and how sad in retrospect that we lost, you know, almost 50 years of research due to misunderstanding of these molecules, uh, misidentification and classification of these, you know, right alongside with heroin, um, and how much time was lost that we could have been working to save people's lives and function. Yeah, that's a great point. And I just want to honor you and see you. Uh, thank you for being of service and making a difference, especially with youth. And that sounds absolutely incredible. So uh, very yeah. cool. Thank you for bringing that to the table here. Uh, just to 
go a little bit deeper as well with everything we're talking about, like building neuroplasticity. As, what are some ways that we could actually get back to that that like five year old self or that child self of seeing with awe, so that we can regrow the brain? Well, I think then what you're talking about are different techniques in order to change our perception, right? We've talked about using psychedelics, but uh, as you know, uh, you can use breath very effectively. Uh, meditation can certainly be used. What we're talking about is ways of entering non-normal states, which can do the same for us uh, as psychedelics have done. Um, the great uh, yogis of the past, of course, would go to caves and they would sit in the dark so that they couldn't see, so that they couldn't hear. And in so doing, then, they were taking these inward journeys that would unlock um, some, you know, likely endogenous, which means coming from you, chemicals, which are very similar to um, these psychedelics. You know, th we haven't talked on this um, anatomically, but there is thought that the pineal gland uh, may produce a DMT, which is a tryptamine uh, psychedelic agent, that that may have a role in dreaming, that there may be more of it in your mind when you're a child, and that's replaced uh, when the sex hormones come up. Uh, through puberty. And so we don't have these magical experiences. We're not seeing fairies or relatives anymore. And you know, all of these things kind of change. And then that may come back to us again as our <clears throat> sex hormones re-regulate, re you know, in, in our older years, and we open up again to kind of new experiences. And there have been rat studies, which have shown fairly conclusively that there is DMT uh, in the body. I, I don't believe there's been any uh, replicated human studies that have shown um, uh, the same, but, you know, we hear all the time about, and I, this comes across my feed, like on YouTube and Instagram and things like that, but, you know, breathing techniques <clears throat> to, to produce the DMT experience or something like that. You may know more about this than I do, um, but anything you can do, people do fasting. So there's austerity measures, um, Something as simple as, you know, journaling, you know, gratitude prayers every morning where you go through, you know, and really try to identify. I'm, I'm so happy I'm alive right now. I'm so happy that I get to wake up and I don't know what's going to happen. But to be given that opportunity makes me so grateful. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, the typical integration practices that we would think for a spontaneous, say, call it Kundalini awakening or, and or with psychedelic therapy, plant and earth medicine ceremonies included, of course. Sam, can, uh, you, can you excuse me for one moment, please? Yeah. Are, are, you, are you hearing flute music in the back? Oh, no, not, not at all. You don't is hear it, anything? Is it okay. distracting for you? No, it isn't. I just wanted to make sure that your listeners that are listeners today wouldn't have to. I, I have a, a husky and the husky likes to vocalize along with my daughter playing flute. So I've got this kind of duet going on between husky yowling and flute, but it's my normal life. So I uh, put yeah. it in it, it's, funny. it's funny a lot of times the mics don't pick that up but i appreciate you asking yeah i was just saying a lot of the typical integration practices will lend itself well to building neuroplasticity i know for me one of the things that comes up is getting into that theta brainwave state and mm -hmm. it's my understanding that that's where we can actually create those new neural networks could you speak to that at all you know, I don't have a lot of direct experience with that. Uh, okay. It falls a little bit more into the neurology realm than the neurosurgery mm -hmm. realm. Uh, I don't do EEGs. I don't work with any of that. And I think because of that, I've become a little bit of a, a structuralist <laughs> in yeah. terms of the brain. No, that's and, cool. That's cool. All good. I appreciate although that. I know, I know the gateway uh experience. Are you familiar with the, the Monroe Institute and that whole thing? I'm not sure I am. Well, yeah. So the Monroe Institute, and this is a gentleman who was working with entering the astral, I think, through using different binaural beats and different uh, audiology mm. and right. putting you into these different states, and he would move you through into the theta 
and <laughs> it's it gained renown recently because it was discovered that the government had been using it in order to you know try to weaponize it and you know use clear audio or clairvoyance in order to peer on our enemies and doing things like that so there's been some declassified information uh, about that but yeah, I, I've got these tapes that I've listened to that are supposed to, you know, push you into these states as well. And I've had some very remarkable experiences there. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. You know, one of the things I was going to ask you next, which was funny that this was going to be why I asked you. And then when you asked me that question, I'm like, mm, I'm trying to locate in the file folders of my brain and be like, hey, it's not coming to me right now, but maybe it's filed away somewhere but the question i was going to ask is like how come sometimes we feel like we're firing on all cylinders and i know obviously like nootropics can really help with this and a lot of the different things that we're talking about but just on a day-to-day -day basis why why is it sometimes we feel like we're firing on all cylinders as it relates to our brain and other days we don't feel that way well sleep is very important of course as somebody in neurosurgery who's chronically insomniac and poorly rested uh you know i know that if i'm able to get a full night's sleep eight hours the next day i'm like is this what people feel like all the time yeah. <laughs> is this like is this people's normal state because i feel like superman right yeah. now and of course there's all sorts of other things that are going on health wise within us you know the body is a neural network as well as a network of organs and uh, the second largest network uh, of neurons and a neurologic structure is in our gut you know this is why we feel things in the gut and so digestive issues can certainly cause problems with how you're feeling um, and then simply, uh, I would say stress and distraction as well, too, like failure to be in the moment to appreciate what's happening in a relaxed way that allows you to be open to what's happening. And that provides a certain um, optimism, perhaps, in which the, we are able to view the world uh, when we have a lot that's going on subconsciously and unconsciously with us. We're not really present in that moment. We're not able to function properly. We're reacting rather than behaving in conscious ways that can be experienced as, you know, not being on or not being a, a, on, in, on fire in that regard, too. And so really any of these types of things, both within and without us, that create these distracting types of um, impediments keep us from being uh, in that moment to, to the fullest way possible. We could also even talk about perhaps the flow state here, you know, mm -hmm. putting ourselves in situations where through both discipline and then surrender after we've achieved some degree of expertise allows us to just be in this open and flowing state, which may feel like a, you know, a very on, a very on kind of condition for us. So. You know, all of these things, most certainly, how they all manage to come together at some points. And we have these little windows of opportunity where we're both feeling very healthy and not particularly stressed and able to appreciate kind of the miracle of our own being and the wonder of what's going on around us. I think also, too, you know, with my own self um, corporeally, in terms of being a 63 year old man versus, you know, what I've been before, which is not a 63 year old man. It's my ability to feel like I physically and mentally have what it takes to face the unknown, to face whatever's coming at me. I feel physically fit enough to maybe run if I need to. Uh, I feel engaged, alert, and um, cognitively uh, facile enough to interpret what's happening to me. That makes me feel pretty positive and pretty good. If I'm a chronic pain person and my hips hurt and I don't think that I can move, because of that I've become obese and I'm not eating well. Um, I'm feeling because of that, that I'm depressed and I don't feel good about myself. When I don't feel good about myself, I'm not sure I can handle what's coming because I'm frankly tired of it all, tired of having to be in a world that I don't feel competent and ready to, to take care of. That creates a situation where I'm not open, that I'm not on, I don't feel good about things. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that all makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. And, and you mentioned depression and I, you brought up earlier too. And I wanted to ask like, what exactly, 
uh, and maybe we can talk about a few things here because the a couple of things I had questions on were specifically were depression and psychosis. And I know those don't go together, but I'm just saying like when these different things, maybe one is depression, another psychosis happens, what's going on in the brain there? So once again, this is starting to move a little bit outside of okay. my expertise. Um, I I would you you rightly separate these two, although we could certainly think that if you pull back far enough, there you know these distinctions start to blend and merge, and everything becomes very spectral, right? Um, but, no worries. Uh, let's let's switch gears because I got plenty more questions. I I have whole notes here of like, okay, ask this, ask that. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that's probably more up your alley because it's structure is you mentioned the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. These are the two yeah. glands that I personally know about, and I don't even know if there's more. Maybe there. I'm sure there are. There are other glands that. Uh, I mean, adrenal glands. Is that it's a brain function? Is that in the brain? The adrenals. <laughs> It is in the way that let's talk about the thyroid because okay. that's something that the thyroid that people know about primarily. You know, it's a structure which sits here in the neck behind this shell of cartilage there, and it's responsible for um, regulating, um, you know, heart rate and, and blood pressure in some regards, energy levels, and, and other things like this. Now, what it does is it is able to release its own hormones, which are called, let's say, T3 and T4 for thyroid. But it requires a message to come from the pituitary gland by way of um, thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. And the amount of TSH, which is being uh, secreted is based upon these uh, chemoreceptors, which are stationed throughout the body, figuring out how much T3 or T4 you've got floating around. So you've got this loop where it's like sampling and testing, and it's like, okay, this much TSH, and then the thyroid is able to produce that. And so what you have here is kind of what they call the master gland, which is the pituitary gland, which is then telling, you know, the other glands of the body, more more particularly perhaps, um, you know, the gonads and the reproductive organs as well, which are part of this system, um, how to behave and when to behave, what these cycles are. And, um, you know, just to kind of link them with some more esoterics, you know, you have the chakra system of the body, which is described as these energy centers, which move and change from seven major chakras uh, through, I think there's hundreds of them perhaps that are described in, in different uh, Vedic literatures. But, you know, often that's felt that these are associated with these endocrine glands. And so you've got this matching up of this spirituality with physical physicality you know which is uh, always very interesting to me when you start to see these things layered that way and so the pituitary gland you know is certainly one of those glands um, sometimes talked about as you know the third eye chakra but i think more uh the pineal gland that you're speaking of which is a uh, center where the pituitary gland if this is the brain uh it's like sitting down underneath it by, by the eyes and the pineal gland is like central and deep. And it's responsible for uh, sleep regulation, uh, releasing uh, melatonin and uh, possibly DMT we've spoken of before. One of the reasons they call it the third eye is that there are photoreceptors on this um, structure. And uh, so it's responsible for setting sleep and waking cycles based upon light. And uh, in that way, um, you know, it becomes very important um, for, for regulating that. Uh, this is why with some of my patients that uh, are having trouble sleeping, perhaps they've been in the hospital a long time, uh, they've lost their, um, um, their cycles and their rhythms for sleeping, I recommend going out in the morning before 10 a.m., no matter when you went to bed, and opening your eyes in the bright sunshine don't stare directly at the sun but open your eyes outside for you know a good 10 or 15 minutes that sets the pineal gland to put your sleep cycle about 16 hours in the future 
and then you oh, can wait, wait. I have a question right there because I live in Sankers, which you know, and it's very foggy out here. Luckily, today the the this is summer, by the way. If you're listening to uh, this in the future, end of July, but um, luckily this morning the sun came out around ten. But there's for the past two months, a lot of the time the sun hasn't come out till two or three p.m. Sometimes yeah. till five, like just fog all day. And I've actually been having a, a big, tr uh, I've been having trouble sleeping as of late. Yeah. Um, and usually I have a very good circadian rhythm. Like even before I even knew that phrase, like my whole life, I've been pretty much, the sun comes up, I'm awake, sun goes down in the winter, six o'clock, I'm going to bed, you know? Uh, yeah. So would that be part of the reason why I've been having trouble sleeping as of late? Because the sun's not coming out? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Although the visible spectrum of light is only a part of the sun's energy, which is coming down to us, uh, it is a, a large part of what's setting those cycles for you. And as we know, of course, with in certain places where they don't have a lot of sunshine, we can get depression associated with this as well. And uh, not to mention, you know, the importance of vitamin D and vitamin D and calcium and how that works with the gut, how important the sun is for that. So, yeah, absolutely. If you're in an area which doesn't provide you that kind of sunshine, it can affect your sleep and your emotional uh, cycles. That Yeah, that makes sense. All of a sudden, when you said that, I was like, oh, that clicks. Because for the past week or two, I've been sitting here like, I don't know why I'm having such a hard time falling asleep. And it's almost like taking co drinking coffee in the afternoon you know because all of a sudden i feel awake now you know yeah. so that makes sense yeah. okay cool thank you so with uh, one more question this might be the last one have you heard of something called aphantasia uh it sounds very familiar can you describe it for me I'm not sure exactly what it is, but someone told me that they don't see visions and psychedelics. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's less know what it is and uh, anything that comes up with like visions and why some people may not be as um, visually uh, like see, have visions with psychedelics or even just meditation, you know, yeah. not even just it would be the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not certain structurally or chemically what the distinctions are if this is something which can be genetic uh, if it's something that can be uh, brought upon by trauma or disease or if it is something uh, I'm, I'm sure it could be all of these things right uh, all of these things combined but some people don't think about things in terms of pictures they can't imagine an orange elephant i think that's what you're talking about right yeah 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 and i i know someone uh, within this community uh, who has this particular way of seeing and thinking about the world. And uh, I think if I'm right in interpreting some of the ways that he's spoken to me about his experiences, it, it, it's far less visual. But let me add, um, in his work with and, and dimethyltryptamine, which is a DMT, when most people talk about DMT, to, to, to clarify the distinctions between 5-MeO DMT, which is commonly thought of as toad venom and as a separate uh, molecule. But uh, whereas the 5-MeO DMT is classically not a very visual uh, experience, and DMT is typified by its almost carnivalesque cascade of multidimensional um, visions. And he does have visions within this realm. Uh, how they differ in their intensity or complexity, perhaps, with somebody who doesn't have this, because he, he tells me, and I probably didn't say this, he tells me that he can't think of things in terms of pictures. He has this, uh, this um, way of seeing the world. So, uh, in some ways, uh, this is very interesting, and it, it speaks to perhaps other ways of um, visualization in the mind that don't go uh, in line with these classical structures or ways of perhaps using these non-normal uh, states in order to visualize things in ways that we can't in our in our waking world. So, yeah, I would say... Can I prove that somebody who is not able to visualize pictures in their mind then won't visualize them? 
uh, in uh, psychedelic experiences. I, I would probably lean on saying that, that there's a variety of responses to that. I, I do spend some time in uh, Reddit psychedelic communities and other kind of integration communities where, you know, hopefully I'm able to lend some context or at least discuss with uh, people who are having these experiences. You know, uh, psychedelics have become very easy to obtain. And mm -hmm. very powerful psychedelics, you know, are now in vape pens, 5-MeO-DMT, which is called, you know, the God molecule, because it rips, me. Um, I'm going to change my language here, because it changes your relationship with yourself as being a person in such a way as it may be described as ego dissolution, and then deposits you uh, in this kind of non-dual uh, situation where you don't see yourself in context of relationship anymore. Um, and that can obviously to, let's say, a 14-year-old boy who gets a hold of a vape pen with one of these and thinks he's going to have a marijuana type experience be, and be very unsettling. And so I, I'm in these communities kind of lurking as ways to perhaps provide some guidance, context, uh, context and contacts with true integration specialists if they need them. And so this is a long preamble to saying that I have run across posts by individuals who say that they have this, uh, this syndrome and that their psychedelic experiences are fairly non-visual. So. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. And you're, you're so right. Something you said earlier, about like how it's sad the past 50 years with psychedelics like you know and we just kind of threw them out now it's this re resurgence in the third yeah. wave and in a lot of ways it is the wild west right now so i appreciate you trying or not trying but actually like getting out there and providing good tools and resources because it, it's scary to me just thinking about all the situations that can happen i haven't necessarily thought about like uh, a kid getting their hands on a dmt whatever it's 5meo or an ndmt vape pen and yeah for sure but just reckless facilitators recklessness everywhere we go and just it's way too accessible these days and the reference has uh been kind of thrown out and it's just yeah. like it's just a fun thing to do like it's almost like you know drinking a beer after work and for right. some people you know and that's an issue yeah and I would add to that that and this is a discussion I've had with practitioners in this particular field we are in a danger where these substances become mainstreamed uh, the molecules perhaps get changed a little bit but the effect is somewhat the same perhaps they change psilocybin to something else which can then be uh, trademarked and profited off of but in so doing it becomes just the new prozac in order to respond to a society which is becoming like progressively uh, i guess i'll use the word sick uh, both physically and and emotionally uh, what we're seeing with um, um you know chronic disease epidemics and depression epidemics and things like that which are re responses to both a, a society which no, no longer feels loving open and connected but also to food sources which are uh, unhealthy for us and so we devise you know oftentimes and i don't want to get too conspiratorial here but some of the same companies that make the foods then make medicines like ozempic or something like that uh, so that we can like eat the food that makes us fat and unhealthy but then take the pill which makes us thin so we don't feel bad about ourselves and so what we're seeing then is you know with uh, psychedelics being called you know the new ssris and in so doing then they become just the new band-aid and what we lose from these, and this is something you were alluding to, is the mystical transcendent experience that comes from, you know, doing these in a reverential and ceremonial way. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to seem like a gatekeeper in this regard. There's always some, some danger of that when we start talking about how something should be used and how it shouldn't be used, right? It's, uh, there's some concern there. But, you know, we need to be thoughtful in that regard, too. And remember that there is an opportunity through using these miraculous substances, which have been given to us at a time in our personal and in our history as a people and human beings, 
which allow us the opportunity to transcend biases, prejudices, fears, hatreds, and all of the other lower energy, lower vibrational states, which have led to this divisive, balkanized, dualistic, hyper-politicized um, state that we find ourselves in, in America, certainly today. And so rather than just using them as band-aids to cover up what the society is causing symptomologically to change the society that we're in through entering these states of higher vibrational, higher frequency, what might be called divine states in order then to change our world. And, you know, this is what Joe Dispenza talks about, and this is what, uh, you know, a lot of great mystical teachers talk about, you know, the change has to begin within you, and then you end up radiating and um and resonating with the rest of society that way you know the kingdom of heaven is within this is the place where we have to go change yourself first put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you put oxygen on the person sitting next to you on the plane that's spiraling down so keeping these medicines from being just another thing that we're going to say you know brought to you by you know Pfizer psilocybin before Anderson Cooper comes on and remembering that, that there's a holiness to this there's a, a divinity to this and you know outside of any formal religious structure uh you know I would just say you know to anyone who has thought about working with these medicines that there's more here than simply fixing the depression or the anxiety there's something holy that's available to us absolutely and you know it, it i like to see how you you got to the same place that i was eventually going to take us as well because if this has been a very grounded conversation and my message is about soul life balance yin and yang fe feminine masculine right so we need both and this has been very grounded but the spiritual side of this is like okay we can't get too lost in that frequency of fear of what could be because we know and many of you listening working with psychedelics plant and earth medicines or maybe 5meo dmt the toad medicine we are constantly creating our reality and shifting timelines so okay. if we are in a frequency of fear of a specific thing that's going to get mirrored back to us and this yeah. is where there's like this delicate dance of not putting our head in the sand and right. getting lost in spiritually bypassing which is why it is a balance but that yeah. said jonathan thank you so much for taking the time to share sure. with us your wisdom i appreciate how you show up in the world thank you for everything and thanks so much thank you and goodbye everybody see you out there <laughs>